Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Ignite News at Mohawk College. I'm Sam McFadden. And I'm Rebecca Anderson. Neighbor to Neighbor is a well-known charitable organization around Hamilton. Ignite News reporter Tyson Wells took a look at a new initiative. It's nearing the holiday season and charities are once again reaching out for donations to support those in need. But Neighbor to Neighbor is one charity that is taking the unconventional route to feed stomachs and minds. This week, the Neighbor to Neighbor bookstore, located at 28 Athens Street, is holding a book sale with all proceeds collected in support of the food bank. We'll go through times where donations are down. I mean, this is the time of the year. It begins with Thanksgiving. Everybody wants to give thanks. And so they, they think of us, and that's great. Christmas time, people think of us, and that's great. And again, at Easter. But in the summertime, people are busy. So when we have that ebb and flow that's going on, this kind of money coming in from the bookstore at tremendous prices for the people who come in and love books. Um, this sustains us. This keeps us going. It's not the biggest money in the world, but if you need a couple thousand dollars to go out and buy a canned tuna, then you know you've got some funds that are coming in. Books are currently 30% off with prices ranging from around 50 cents to $1.50. All the books are community donated. Anything from classics to nonfiction to children's books and even collectibles are being sold. Last year, the used bookstore raised over $18,000, a number that Fairway hopes to match again this year. Roughly one in six Hamiltonians fall below the poverty line. We're currently dealing with 1,200 families per month. That represents 5,000 people. 40% of them are children. The mountain is perceived still to be the land of milk and honey. Well, it's not. Hamilton Mountain has changed. The per capita poverty rate on Hamilton Mountain is now 16%. And I can tell you about a neighborhood that's very close to Mohawk College, where the poverty rate is running at 35%. This is Hamilton Mountain we're talking about. That's Hamilton Mountain. And that's not the only neighborhood that is facing challenges. And because we're the only food bank on the mountain and resource counseling agency, we're the ones who are dealing with those 1,200 families. The bookstore is open Monday to Friday from 9.30 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. Reporting for Ignite News, I'm Dyson Wells. Second semester of tuition is coming up. Ignite News reporter Shannon Brownlee has a look at where students can get some help. Putting yourself through school is overwhelming and expensive, especially if students don't have any help. Luckily, Mohawk does have many options for financial aid. By visiting the square, students can be provided with answers for all questions about financial aid and what their best option may be. Pamela Smith shares some of the options available for students seeking financial aid. You can apply for OSAP, you can apply for tuition bursaries uh, each semester. If you're part-time, you can apply for part-time OSAP, or you can apply for IFSB if you're a continuing education student. We do have a bursary program that's offered uh, prior to each semester. Currently, for January, we do have the um, financial need assessment profile. It's open. It opened last week and will continue to be open until the middle of January. Applying for these bursaries is relatively simple. On the website it says like financial bursaries and you click on it and you have to fill out an application online and then you just have to write like a little paragraph explaining or a small essay explaining why you need it and like how it'll help you. There are many bursaries that most students know nothing about. Financial assistance bursary is based upon students tuition fees. We're obligated to take 30 percent of um, uh, or a certain percentage of students' tuitions and devote it to bursaries. And we do that in several different ways. We do um, the tuition uh, bursary, we do um, financial um, assessment assistance bursary for students with disabilities, um, bus shuttle bursary, that type of thing. Since not everyone is eligible for OSAP, there are many other options out there. There are many students that receive assistance if they're restricted from OSAP or, um, you know, get a nil award. They can apply for um, the financial need assessment for tuition assistance or certainly a student line of credit through their financial uh, institution. Mohawk students have until January 20th, 2015 to apply for this bursary. Students find out through email by February if these bursaries have been granted. Did you know Jurassic World was coming out in 2015? Yeah, actually, Josh Cooper compared Jurassic World to the original film. Take a look. I'm really proud of you for going on this trip. You're gonna have so much fun. And remember, if something chases you, run. 
Just over six months before the movie's release date, Universal Studios released a trailer to the upcoming fourth film in the Jurassic Park franchise, two days prior to its announced release date. We're slowly introduced into this new park as we head across the ocean to the now fully functional Isla Nubar that was featured in the first film. The first dinos we're introduced to are Gallimimus galloping around a full tourer's van in a shot reminiscent of a similar scene featuring Dr. Grant with the two children in the first film. We're shown orb-like vehicles traveling under rather large sauropods. <laughs> Do they really expect us to believe no one's been crushed yet? Tourists kayaking through a river surrounded by stegosauruses. And then the real show begins. <laughs> the first minute and 15 seconds of the trailer brings to life every single one of my childhood fantasies. This is the Jurassic Park of my dreams. But as we all know, what's a Jurassic Park movie without fear and playing God? Apparently, the scientists at the park didn't learn from the mistakes 20 years ago and are once again hell-bent on taking things too far. And then we just went and made a new dinosaur? Probably not a good idea. Suffice to say, Ian Malcolm's words from 20 years ago ring true. I, I don't think you're giving us our due credit. Our scientists have done things which nobody's ever done before. Yeah, yeah, but your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could that they didn't stop to think if they should. And life finds a way to send the vacationer-filled park into shambles. The trailer gives us a real feel for leading man Chris Pratt's role as a member of Jurassic World's on-site staff who conducts behavioral research on the Velociraptors. He seems to me to be a bit of a cross between Robert Muldoon and Dr. Grant with his tough but knowledgeable demeanor. Here's hoping for Pratt's sake, he doesn't meet a clever girl. Clever girl. Pratt provides the voice of reason when he hears of the park's scientist experiments, and evidently, just like in the first film, no one listens until it's too late. Bryce Dallas Howard plays one of the park's scientists and is shown in a scene eerily reminiscent of Dr. Ellie Sattler's generator scene with the raptor from the first film. The trailer has only increased my expectations for the film. Please don't pull a bait and switch on me and make this into a terrible movie. I just can't take that anymore. Reporting for Ignite News, I'm Joshua Cooper. Okay. Ignite game reviewer Steven Sobot takes a look at Far Cry 4. Let's check it out. And I Sometimes video games create enemies who are more likable than the protagonist. This is probably because games try to make the protagonist a blank slate so the player can project themselves on them. It's not hard for writers to create someone more interesting than a generic action hero. A good example of this would be Voss from Far Cry 3. While he clearly is the enemy, having tortured you and killed your brother, he has moments of brilliance that really stick with you. I tell you what the definition of insanity is. Insanity is doing the exact same f***ing thing over and over again Shit. to change. That is crazy. So will the next game's antagonist be as memorable as the previous? Well, let's see. Far Cry 4 is the fourth installment of the action-adventure first-person shooter series developed by Ubisoft. You play as Ajay Gale, a young man who's traveling to the fictional country of Karat to bring his mother's ashes there as her last wish. His bus gets stopped by the Karate military and he is met face-to-face -face with Karat's king and the primary antagonist, Pagan Min. You escape capture and meet up with the Golden Path, a revolutionary group fighting against Pagan Min's tyranny. Far Cry 4's setting of Kirat is very similar to Nepal in the Himalayas. Since much of the area is mountainous and forested, you get around by ziplining and mountain climbing. Once you've discovered location, you can quick travel to the different places you've been to. I find quick travel breaks your immersion in the game, but I think it'd be really annoying to scale up a mountainside for 5 minutes every time you need to replenish your supplies. Like in many Far Cry games, the local wildlife is a secondary enemy which can be either a hindrance or help. You can collect bait from dead animals to throw, attracting predators that will attack anyone near it. This kind of feels like calling for reinforcements, except they're ravenous beasts who don't like you either. One of the biggest selling points to the game is the character of Pagan Min, featured heavily in trailers and on the game cover. Pagan Min is a crazy, maniacal, twisted man who rules Karat with a combination of military strength and propaganda. 
However, his flair really shines and makes him a likable character. Oh, would you hold this? For just a moment, I want to get a little picture right into the camera. There we are. Awesome. However, after the intro cutscene, you hear from him again, not angry that you left the dinner he ordered for you. Andre, my boy, are you busy? You don't mind me calling, do you? Fantastic. You really are an excellent listener. Look, no hard feelings about the crab rangoon. I know it's not to everyone's taste. But you'll be pleased to know I had the chef executed for his incompetence. Or was it his family we killed? I feel like the developers try to make Pagan Min as likable as possible to almost a degree of forcing it. I remember overhearing a rumor that you can beat the game in 10 minutes. Apparently, when Pagan Min says, Don't move. I will be right back. If you wait for 10 minutes, he comes back and you see an alternate ending. I mean, realistically, when a man who has a whole army under his control and kills his own soldiers because they almost killed you asks you to wait a minute, I'd wait a minute. That's just common courtesy. I... W wait, what? He returns. Seriously? Damn. Oh, okay, well, uh, better not spoil too much of the game. Far Cry 4 is available on Steam. PlayStation 3 and 4, and Xbox 360 and 1. Maybe now we can finally shoot some goddamn guns. Looks like our Geek and Out panel is at it again. Let's see what they had to talk about this week. And we're going to talk about a movie that I believe all three of us are a fan of, um, and that's The Hobbit, which is more than one movie, actually. But we're going to talk about all three. Um, what is your favorite thing about The Hobbit? So far? Yeah, so far. <laughs> uh, it's tough to pin it down to one specific thing, but obviously Smaug is awesome. Benedict Cumberbatch, Hollywood's new geek boy, whatever you would call him, <laughs> does a wonderful job. I am fire. I am death. So that's very exciting, and I know he's also doing the sorcerer, or Saruman, or Sauron, my bad. Yes. But does he do the voice of both? Yeah, he does. That's and awesome. It is super awesome. So I'm very excited to see how that develops in the next and the final segment of the Hobbit trilogy. Yes. So that's probably what I'm most looking forward to so far. What about you, Dyson? Uh, I don't know. Every time I, I, I watch uh, the movie, I'm really excited about I'm a Sherlock fan. Um, so Martin Freeman and Benedict Cumberbatch are uh, pretty much like the dynamic duo. So uh, when I find them interacting uh, in the opposite way, where the one's evil and one's good, and so you got Benedict Cumberbatch as the dragon, uh, Martin as uh, the Hobbit. It it it's a really interesting dynamic. Truly, you are mistaken. Oh, Smaug, chiefest and greatest of calamities. I'm always excited about how they interact because so you know that right after this they're gonna go back to Sherlock, so it's gonna be <laughs> really funny. Like some sort of chemistry there. Yeah. I like about the it wasn't in the first one, but Legolas is in the second one, and he's not in the book. I think he's in the append or the is appendices he like, or the I guess he's not like whatever. really part of the yeah, main not story. part of the main storyline. Yeah, but they've added him to be more of like a main character in the movie, and I love that because it's super cool that you have this like other fighting element. Because when the dwarves fight, it's not really like, it's not. It's more brawny. Yeah, it's, it's not, not, it's not like so much as like elegant. a life skill type of thing. Yeah, exactly. Yes, exactly. The elegance of the elves. Yes, I love mm. that. So it's super cool. And of course, because I'm a huge Lord of the Rings fan, you bring back memories and you bring back <laughs> Legolas, which is great. And Gandalf too. Yes. Um, he's such a huge part of both trilogies and he's the greatest character all the time. Um, so yeah, what do you, I know Dyson has a bone to pick about the music in the I hate the music, but it is so <laughs> Okay, bad. that is actually the worst. The music is awesome. I know. It's, it's so good. I agree. Yeah. It's so lame. I mean, I get it. It's the, the cutesy, cartoony dwarves now, but I mean, I hate, I hate the music that they do. I, I the feel like the best. that's one of the worst. Actually, the Goblin King was the worst one for me because I'm sitting there and I hate musicals. And all of a sudden I'm sitting in a musical and I just want to leave. I. I don't care about <laughs> Goblin Town or any of that, and I'm just sitting there going, 
Yeah, uh, can we go back to the storyline, please? Because I don't understand why we're here. And even when you were upset because I was making fun of the chants that they did, you pay how much money to have an orchestra soundtrack your movie and then you make me watch these dwarves who don't know how to actually sing. Oh my gosh, they definitely know how to sing. sing to me They're for five like minutes? No, I'm not okay with that. The low tones were so beautiful and so perfect. Yeah, it'd be even oh, better with a trained totally musician. It was, like, it was almost like monk chant. It, it fit really well with the time. If I want to like watch a monk chant, I'll go to in. Geography Channel or something and watch monks chant. But guys, aside from the chanting, in the trailer for The Battle of the Five Armies, the newest Hobbit movie, in the trailer, they play Pippin's song, which was in, I believe, uh, Return of the King, which gave me crazy goosebumps. So are we okay with that music? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I like it when song. it serves a purpose. I'm okay <laughs> yeah. with that. But when it doesn't serve a purpose, I mean, just it served a purpose. don't put That's it in. got me really excited for the movies. <laughs> <laughs> music is never a problem, in my opinion. It doesn't matter if it's chanting or if it's one person singing. It doesn't matter. Anyway, we can... Agree that we're excited for agree the music. Agree to disagree about, about the music. <laughs> yeah, we can disagree about the music, but we can agree that we're excited for the trilogy to. Well, Very. I'm not excited for it to finish, but the new would be. I think that the, the new one is going to be the best one of the three yes. segments. I think so, so too. I'm very excited. Yeah, we're all excited. It's going to be great. Thanks for hanging out and talking about the Hobbit. We'll see you next week. This behind the world ahead. And there are many paths to tread Through shadow To the edge of night Hey, welcome back to Geeking Out. I'm Jess, this is Elisa, and right now we're talking about the Flash vs. Arrow crossover that's upcoming from the CW. So Elisa, how do you feel about this crossover? So excited! I could not be more excited about this. The, the shows on their own are already so good. Arrow has had a lot of time to build itself up to be great, but The Flash just started and I'm already such a fan. They've done so well with the characters already and now to see them combine all these great characters, it's gonna be epic, I'm so excited. Do you have any predictions? That's, about? oh my God, that's such a great question because we have seen them cross over before, right? Mm -hmm. We saw them in season two of Arrow with the scientist and three ghosts. And now we're getting to see them do it again. But last time it was more Barry Allen comes to Starling City. He's just kind of a noob. He doesn't have his powers yet. <laughs> he's, he's, he's just a CSI assistant that's kind of playing hooky from his job. <laughs> he has nothing unique about him in the way of super speed or powers or whatever. Mm -hmm. This time, he is a full-fledged superhero, and judging from the preview, it looks like he's going to go a little bit uh, insane. I don't know <laughs> how that happens, but I'm so excited because Barry is such a kind of a bland, vanilla character, so I'm ready for him to be like, yeah, I'm evil now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's cool that he... Because we've always seen him as this like sweet kind of like I'm just gonna save everybody kind of a thing, like not kind of almost one dimensional in that sense. Yeah, he's got a white knight complex. Yes, um, so it'll be cool to have him change personalities kind of, and for Oliver to come in and have to in a in a way rescue him, and because we've seen Oliver in just the little bits that they've been together, sort of mentor him a little bit. A little bit, yeah. Um, so I get we get to see that continue. But also, aside from Oliver and Barry, we get to see the rest of their teams come together. So we've got Felicity and Diggle. We have Caitlin and um, Cisco. Cisco. Yeah, so it'll be cool to see all of them come together. And um, I think, I wonder what villains we're going to have. I know come Captain in here. Boomerang is making an appearance. Uh. Remember? Um, in one of the last episodes of Arrow, they had that crazy, freaky, supersonic boomerang thing. I'm not yeah. even sure if it was supersonic, but it was just like an angry boomerang. Mm -hmm. That guy, he yes. was so creepy, it's delicious. <laughs> yeah. He was scary, yeah. It freaks me out a little bit. It and did. his weapon is so, like... Crazy. I would never watch that episode again in the dark by myself. <laughs> yeah. That is a no. bad idea. It's <laughs> worse than a horror movie. No, but yeah, he should be a good villain. And uh, I, whatever villain um, changes Barry's um, mindset kind of a thing, 
is gonna be cool. But is it gonna be a villain or is it gonna be mm. Dr. Wells? Cause he mm. is really shifty. He's and you already know my position on him <laughs> yeah. and his he's fake wheelchair. Yes, he's not cool. He's very sketchy, especially after the last one when it's he, okay. well, we won't spoil it for anybody, but it's okay, boy. he's very creepy. And it'll be cool to see maybe what the Arrow team thinks about Dr. Wells. Cause now they'll kind of all be in the same general area. But um, it's exciting that yeah. these shows are coming together and we get to see it not just in one episode, but over two nights. So we get to see um, the Arrow people go to Central City and the Flash people go to Sterling City. It's gonna be great, I'm really excited. It's like a double stuffed Oreo. There's just <laughs> double the action and the fun and the flavor and it's just gonna be amazing. Yes. Well, the excitement continues for <laughs> another, how long? How many days do we have left? Oh God, I don't even it's know. It's Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> Almost a week. Oh, I can't wait that long. <laughs> we will wait patiently and then celebrate about the awesomeness that it will be. Because and it will be awesome. Yes, and we'll be back to talk about that uh, next time on Geeking Out. Thanks for watching. The D-Mark is gonna be really busy come March as Mohawk prepares to host a CCAA tournament. Carlin McGill has the story. Mohawk College will be hosting the 2015 CCAA Men's National Championship in the spring for colleges across Canada. This year will mark the 40th anniversary since the tournament began in 1975 at the Mount Royal College in Calgary. The national championships feature the top eight teams from across Canada, including five conference championships, the host team and two wildcards. The Mohawk Athletic and Recreation Department will be responsible for coordinating and hosting the CCAA and OCAA championships. Michelle Ball, Director of Student Engagement and Athletics, says this tournament is important for Mohawk and will be a great opportunity for the students. The, the National Basketball Championships are the crown jewel of sport in Canada. It's uh, the biggest, pretty much the biggest championship that you can host. So it's really going to have a lot of pride for our school and it's going to provide some great opportunities for students to do some on-the-job learning at the championships. Head coach Brian Yonker says this tournament is a season-long preparation. You know, the goal obviously is to just get better every day so that hopefully come March, you're playing your best basketball at the right time of the year. So it's not so much that we take any different approach than we would any other year. It's just that we know that the, the end of the season, we know we're going to be involved in the tournament this year regardless of what happens. The tournament will be held at the Debark at the end of March. For Ignite Sports, I'm Carlin McGill. Looks like there'll be a familiar face on the volleyball court this season. Yes, Adam Sheetal has made his return to Mohawk since his debut with the team in 2007 and 2008. Let's take a look. Adam Sheetal has a long history in the sport of volleyball, traveling the globe to compete. Sheetal started his volleyball career in high school, but it wasn't until college that he really started to blossom as a player. Played at Durham College first to start and uh... Like my coach will say, if you can't beat them, join them. And so uh, I got recruited here afterwards. After I took a year off, I was playing some uh, beach volleyball in Australia and uh, got recruited back here in Mohawk in 07, 08. And then uh, was done there for a while. And then I'm back here again because A, not for volleyball, but for academics. And uh, just wasn't happy with my life and where I was at. And so I'm back here trying to better my life and uh, mainly focusing on school. This, this is just an extra thing to do. This season, Sheetal has returned to Mohawk seven years after his debut with the team in 2007 and 2008. He says this is not only a great group of guys, but one of the best rounded teams he has ever played on. I really enjoy it. It's a great group of guys. It's probably one of the best teams I've ever played on. Best group of guys playing, like being played with or whatever. But uh, I just really enjoy it. We're probably the deepest team that I've ever been on. Like comparing it back to our 07, 08 team, we were, we were a, good te a very good team with very skilled players. But this team is a lot more, it's a lot deeper. Like we have 14 guys that can come on and compete every night. And I trust every single one of them. And all in all, I just enjoy it a lot. Sheetal says after playing for so many years, he's matured as a player and wants to be the guy his teammates can look up to. Over the times and playing with older people and seeing how mature those people are and how 
if you want to be a leader, you can't be a loose cannon. You got to be calm, collective, and watch your emotions and control your emotions. And I struggled with that as a young athlete, and I think that now being older and being the oldest on the team, I have to make sure that it's even more in check and make sure that I control them even more because I have guys watching me and looking up to me seeing as I'm the captain. Having his team ranked third in the country and being the oldest on the team adds no pressure to Sheetal's game. Um, I don't think it's any more pressure, no. I think these guys, they've competed at a national level just like I have. They have won a provincial goal just like I have, so I don't think there's any more pressure on me than any of the other people. No, that's... A, it's the first week of uh, ranking, so really that doesn't mean anything to me, right? At the end of the day, unless you have a medal, and our goal is nationally number one, so to me that ranking means nothing. After growing up with Sheetal in the volleyball program, head coach Matthew Schnarr says he has seen substantial growth in both his game and as a person. Where Adam is now then compared to where he was when he was playing back at Durham College and even his last year, his fourth year at Mohawk, uh, he's matured a whole lot. Um, he's been through um, a lot of personal uh, ventures that have has led him back here and when he approached me about possibly coming back to play for us, um, the first thing I said is what do you what do you want to do academically? And uh, he had a plan which he's never really had before. So when he, when we sat down and talked about uh, his future with the program this season and, and coming in, um, uh, it, it fit into what we were doing. Uh, he had a lot of things to convince me about first academically that he was here for his career, and uh, he's doing fantastic in school and he's done a heck of a job uh, leading these younger guys to, you know, what our ultimate goal is, which is a national medal. And uh, he's lived and breathed that already. So his experiences and our experiences last year um, uh, finishing fifth in the country uh, is really helping us. And uh, it's a pleasure to have him back and, and seeing his uh, attitude change completely. Sheetal and the Mountaineers will host Cameron on the 29th for their last game before Christmas break. For Ignite Sports, I'm Sam McFadden. That's all for this week's edition of Ignite News. I'm Sam McFadden. And I'm Rebecca Anderson. Thanks for watching.